keep your Bibles open to that very same section. If you're new to Manoa Community Church, we've been going verse by verse through Hebrews chapter 11 in what's been called the Hall of Faith in a preaching series I've entitled Faith. Now, the Hall of Faith is an amazing section in the book of Hebrews. These Christians are discouraged. They're looking to abandon their faith in Jesus. And the author of Hebrews highlights the supremacy of Jesus Christ. And then he goes in chapter 11 through all of these saints in the Old Testament, these elders of old, and he goes one after the other after the other, highlighting their faith. So we began with Abel was the first uh, Old Testament saint, and we've made it all the way to verse 32 in a mini-series now in the Hall of Faith on the judges. Now this has highlighted not only their faith because we're commended to emulate their faith, but it's allowing us also to sweep through the Old Testament at a fast pace and say, why did these individuals make the Hall of Faith? Now, in verse 32, you don't need to flip there, but I'll put it on the screens. The author writes as follows. And what more shall I say? For time would fail me to tell of Gideon, Barak, Samson, Jephthah, etc. You can pull that back to the, take that back down. Go back to the header screen there. So he goes to this list of these four individuals, right? And he says, I don't have enough time to talk about Gideon and Barak and et cetera, et cetera. Well, what I said before Easter when we launched into this mini-series on the judges with Gideon is we got time. Because he was focused on going quickly through all of these characters, but we're going slowly through them. And say, what about Gideon's faith? You can go back before Easter and listen to that. Got him on the short list because there were 12 judges during that period, but Gideon made the list of four. Now, true confession, when I got to Barak, I scratched my head at first and said, I forget who Barak is. Not to shame anyone in the room, but do I have anybody else who forgets who Barak is? You can raise your hand. It's all right. Sometimes we forget. I forget names. I forget, you know. But then as I studied it more, I realized, oh, I understand also why I kind of forgot who Barak is. Because he's not one of the twelve. And so I had to go back and say, who was Barak? And I realized he was the commander of the army of the Lord of 10,000. Deborah was the judge. And what we saw just read here now is the song of Deborah and Barak. And so it, it led me on this rabbit trail journey of looking at the judge of Deborah and the commander of Barak, but looking at it through the lens of Barak's faith. Because reminder, Barak made the hall of faith. What is it about Barak that is commended to us, that we should imitate his faith on the road to faith. And I've called today's sermon, The Road to Selfless Glory, because there's a lot of surprises on the road that Barak and Deborah take that I think will surprise us as well and help us on our own roads of faith and our own roads of selfless glory. It's quite a bit, two chapters. I'm not going to read all of it, but we will sweep through quite a bit of it. So just to get us started, I want to read verses 1 to 9. Please follow along, and then I will pray for us and enter into the sermon, The Road to Selfless Glory. So begin in verse 1 of chapter 4. This is the cycle we see over and over again after God raised up a judge, Ehud and Shamgar. There's deliverance, but then they do what is evil in the sight of the Lord again after Ehud died. That's the previous judge. And then they spiral into greater sin. So the Lord sold them into the hand of Jabin, king of Canaan, the Canaanites, who reigned in Hazor. The commander of his army was Sisera, who lived in Herashabeth, Hagoim. Then the people of Israel cried out to the Lord for help. For he had 900 chariots of iron, and he oppressed the people of Israel cruelly for 20 years. Now, Deborah, a prophetess, the wife of Lapidoth, was judging Israel at that time. She used to sit under the palm of Deborah between Ramah and Bethel in the hill country of Ephraim. And the people of Israel came up to her for judgment. She sent and summoned Barak, there he is, the son of Abinoam from Kadesh Naphtali, and said to him, Has not the Lord, the God of Israel, commanded you? Go gather your men at Mount Tabor, taking 10,000 from the people of Naphtali and the people of Zebulun. And I will go out to Sisera, that's the other commander, the general of Jabin's army, to meet you by the river, Kishon, with his chariots and his troops. And I will give him into your hands. Barak said to her, If you will go with me, 
I will go. But if you will not go with me, I will not go. And she said, I will surely go with you. Nevertheless, the road on which you are going will not lead to your glory, for the Lord will sell Sisera into the hand of a woman. Then Deborah arose and went with Barak to Kadesh. The road to selfless glory. Let's pray. Well, Father God, we thank you for your holy, perfect word. We thank you for the saints of old in their times of trouble, in their times of mess, even in their times of spiraling in sin. They looked up to where their help came from. Their help comes from the Lord. And you brought deliverers in the past and you bring them today. And so, God, as we look at the faith of Barak coupled with Deborah and others this morning, I pray that their faith would inspire our own, that their example would be uh, an example that we could follow. And even where they fall short, Lord, they relied on your mercy, Jesus, just as we do our own. They're not perfect people, nor are we, but faith doesn't rely on perfection except your own. And so, God, I pray that during this brief message, we, on our road to faith, would experience a road to selfless glory. Take our eyes off of ourselves. May our faith not lead to our own glory, but to your glory. And if there are any here that don't know you, Lord Jesus, I pray that today would be the day of their salvation. Open our hearts to you, we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, my wife and I got married back in 2006, July. And after we got married, we did like a lot of couples, we took a honeymoon. And praise the Lord, we were able to get away for 10 days to Hawaii. That's right. We were able to fly away and get away for 10 days. We were both able to secure the time off. And we went to Kauai and Maui, five days on each island. And on Maui, there is a famous road called the Road to Hana. Now, if you do any research, this is something that every visitor is supposed to do. The road to Hana is, Hana's a little town at the end of the road, and Hana's not really the destination. The road is the destination. You say, well, how so? The road to Hana has over 600 turns, and you're like along the edge of the island, and over 51 lane bridges. And so you are twisting, and you are turning, and you're going. And then if you see another car coming on the bridge, you have to wait on the side of the road. And by the way, the side of the road falls off into the ocean, right? (laughs) And you make all these stops along the way because there's an endless amount of trails you can pull off and go down and see waterfalls and go swimming. And it was incredible. So this day, the whole day, was the road to Hana. And we pulled off on the side of the road, and we curved, and we wound, and we turned, and we stopped, and we hiked. And finally, towards the end of the day, we got to Hana. And it was beautiful. There was great beaches there. We walked around and saw the sun was starting to set, and we played at the beach for a little bit and realized, oh, wait, we got to get out of here because it is dangerous to drive on the road to Hana when it's dark, Because you could barely survive with daylight, but when it's dark, they say, do not travel on the road to Hana. And so as the good new husband that I was, taking my leadership, right, I hopped in the car, brought my new bride, and we were weaving, going just a little bit faster than they advised because it was getting darker and darker and darker. And praise the Lord, we got through the road to Hana and survived. I'm here to live to tell the story. Praise God. Amen. We stopped for dinner, though, and my wife's tummy was just a tad upset by my driving, and I got to experience her first throwing up on our honeymoon. She was pulled over. Sorry, babe, you know. But I share that at the outset of this sermon, the road to selfless glory, because the road of faith is full of turns and twists and dangers and one-lane roads. And this is a fascinating section in our scriptures because it's the spot where most Christians go to fight with one another. And you say, well, why is that, Stefan? Because Deborah's in charge of the church. Deborah's the leader of the church. She's one of 12. And if you believe in women in ministry, this is the spot you go to. It's pre the second wave feminism. She's in a patriarchal society. She's the leader of the church. And the other side says, yeah, but Barak is a wimp because he needs women and the glory goes to women. And they, 
And as I study this, I'm trying to thread this needle and just also tell the story, right? Because Barak's faith is commended to us as a good thing, right, in the hall of faith. And so we're going to look at, she says to him, the road that you are on, Barak, does not lead to your glory. What does that mean? Is that a slight? Is he going to be embarrassed and shamed by the road that he's on? What does that mean that it doesn't lead to his glory? The road of faith, the road to selfless glory. And there's three things we're going to discover from Judges chapter 4 and 5 as it relates to the road to selfless glory. I'll put them up on the screen and we'll go through them slowly one after the other and then make some pastoral application. First, the road to selfless glory unites men and women. That's all of chapter 4. We'll go through it quickly. The road to selfless glory leads to harmonious praise. That's the song of Deborah and Barak. And then the road to selfless glory awakens heroic mothers. We'll look at some of the verses of that song as it relates to the life of Deborah and also heroes in our Bible who are women. Are you guys ready? Let's do this. The road to selfless glory. First, unites men and women. Let's pick things up in verse 8, reread them, and I'm going to go through the actual um, battle that they win, and then the very end where the commander is killed. We'll go quickly through it. But follow along verses 8 through 10, and then I'll read verses 14 to 18, and then tell the rest of the story. So go back. Barak said to her, remember, she summons Barak. He says, if you will go with me, I will go. But if you will not go with me, I will not go. And she said, I will surely go with you. Nevertheless, the road on which you are going will not lead to your glory, for the Lord will sell Sisera, that's the opponent, the other commander, into the hand of a woman. Then Deborah arose and went with Barak to Kadesh. And Barak called out Zebulun and Naphtali to Kadesh. And 10,000 men went up at his heels. And Deborah went up with him. Now, drop down to verse 14. They start this battle, and Deborah said to Barak, she's, they're in the midst of the battle, Up, for this is the day in which the Lord has given Sisera into your hand. Does not the Lord go out before you? So Barak went down from Mount Tabor with 10,000 men following him, and the Lord routed Sisera and all his chariots and all his army before Barak by the edge of the sword. And Sisera got down from his chariot and fled away on foot. And Barak pursued the chariots and the army of Heresh-Osheth Hegoam. Hopefully I'm saying that right. And all the army of Sisera fell by the edge of the sword. Not a man was left. But Sisera fled away on foot to the tent of Jael, the wife of Heber, the Kenite. For there was peace between Jabin and the king of Hazor and the house of Heber, the Kenite. All right, look up here. I'll tell you the rest. And it does get gory. So kids, prepare yourself. <laughs> So he's fleeing away. Everybody else has been demolished. She was right. She prophesied correctly that God would give him the victory. And she prophesied correctly that the glory would not go to him as the commander, but to a woman. Because Sisera flees away on foot, hides in this tent of Jael. Now, she's kind of perceived as a neutral third party. He believes he's safe hiding in there. But actually, she's on God's team. She is fighting the battle for the Lord. She is on the Israelites' team. So he goes in there and he says, please hide me. He says, come on in. Come on in. And he's exhausted. And so he lays down and she puts a blanket over him. And he's like, please give me a drink of water. And so she gives him a skin of milk. And he drinks the milk and he falls fast asleep. And while he's under the cover, fast asleep, snoozing, she takes a tent peg. Brace yourself. She sneaks over, she gets down, places it right by the temple of his head, takes a hammer, and nails it into the ground! (laughs) And kills him! Now that's shocking, I mean, think, think of Hitler hiding away, all right? This is a bad dude, all right? When you see this, you're not supposed to be like, oh, I mean, it's, it is, oh, it's gross, but She just took that dude out, right, like while he was sleeping. And I'll tell you what happens. He comes running. He comes running. The commander of the army comes running. Barak comes running. She says, (laughs) "Yoo-hoo! you looking for somebody? Yes, yes, he's in here. 
Holy smokes, Deborah was spot on. The glory goes to JL. <laughs> now, the, the road to selfless glory unites men and women. Was Barak mad about this? He was not mad about this. He sings a song about this, which will be our next point. He celebrates this. And so as we look at chapter 11 with Barak on the Hall of Faith, it is fascinating to me because full disclosure, I think a lot of us men, our masculinity would be threatened in this moment, right? Like, wait a minute, I'm the commander of the army. I shall get the glory. Barak doesn't care who gets the glory. Deborah told him, if I go with you, just keep in mind, the glory's not going to go to you. The glory's going to go to a woman. And Barak says, that's fine. I need you. You're coming with me, Deborah. That's provocative, isn't it, brothers and sisters? He needs Deborah. And by the way, she does need him as well. She is the judge of all of Israel. She is both judge and prophet, by the way. The only other leader in Israel that was both judge and prophet is Samuel. We'll get to him later. Samuel's a big deal, right? He fills both of those offices. He anoints the first King Saul and ultimately King David launching the Davidic line. I mean, this is a big deal especially in a patriarchal society. How did Deborah get here? I have no idea. I don't know. But I'm so glad she did, right? Like, I'm so glad that she's there and she's speaking the word of God accurately and judging fairly. I was reading in the English Standard Version Study Bible. I have that now, they go to this section, and they say, this is why this is not repeatable today. X, Y, you know, blah, 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 blah. You know, because Judges does have a lot of failures in church leadership. But then they say this. They say, but Deborah was one of the best judges there was out of the 12. <laughs> like, come on, guys. I, I understand what they're trying to do, and there's some complexity. We'll talk on it in the second point. But listen, she was one of the most virtuous judges out of the 12. They all have moral faults and failures. You read Deborah. I'm sure she was a sinner like the rest of us. We just don't see them in the Bible, right? She's a good leader. She judges justly, rightly, and she gets the word of God spot on. And Barak says, she summons Barak, so she's summoning him. She needs Barak, and Barak needs her. She's not going to run his army, right? She, she's speaking the word of God. She's judging justly. She's not a military commander. And by the way, she's the one having the presence of God. He's there and he's, she spoke to him. Remember that and told him, up, up in arms. This is the time to do it. Verse 14, this is the day. There is a synergy. There is a complementarity between these two that is beautiful. It is beautiful and it leads to the victory that God intends for his people that day. And I just think that's so beautiful as we think about the battle of the sexes. I was at a wedding years ago, and the preacher was quoting Genesis 3 <laughs> about the role of a wife. And he said, you know, your desire will be for your husband, and he shall rule over you. So you're to be ruled by him. And even at that time, I believed in more so than I even do now. Like, yeah, husbands have a special leadership role in the marriage, but I would never quote Genesis 3 to assert that because it's the curse, right? That's where God is saying, basically, like, you know, the serpent, he's going to slither on the arms, and man's now going to the sweat of his brow and death, and all of a sudden now he's going to rule over you. That is part of the curse. That's not like God's perfect design for my marriage. Rule, with, like, Jesus came to undo the curse, right? They quoted that same Bible verse, by the way, not to allow women to take pain relief during childbearing. It's supposed to hurt. It's like, no, come on. We want to mitigate the curse wherever we can, right? If you want to, ladies, you don't have to. If you want to grin and bear through the pain, that's on you. But I'm just saying, 
I'm, as a pastor, not going to bind your conscience with the curse for the way you ought to live your lives, all right? And we see in this picture such an ancient, beautiful picture of men and women partnering in ministry together. And here's the key. They don't care who gets the glory. He doesn't care if the women get the glory. And I don't think they care, as we look at the second point, whether the women get all the glory. Because they got their eyes on something totally different, the glory of God. Amen? The road to selfless glory first unites men and women in ministry for victory. I'm so glad Barak didn't tell Deborah to go home. And I know a lot of friends who would. But Barak didn't do that. And because of that, they got to share in the victory together. I can't speculate what would have happened if, if Deborah didn't go. That's uh, an unreality. It never happened. But I would say this before we go on to our second point. I used to think Barak was a coward because somebody taught me that. That Barak was ashamed because somebody said that that quote of her prophecy, I don't believe that. I believe he's a hero too. He made the hall of faith for a reason. Why is his name there and not Deborah's? I don't have all the answers, but he is commended to us in this section for his faith. It is instructive for us. He did the right thing. The road to selfless glory unites men and women. Secondly, the road to selfless glory leads to harmonious praise. Leads to harmonious praise. This has been called in chapter 5 the song of Deborah and Barak. You'll see the header there if you have the ESV. And rightly so, because it says in verse 1, then sang Deborah and Barak, right? The son of Abinoam on that day. So let's just read excerpts from this. I'll read the first three verses, jump around. You can follow along in your Bible or on the screen, but beginning in verse 1. Then sang Deborah and Barak, the son of Abinoam, on that day, that the leaders took the lead in Israel, that the people offered themselves willingly. Bless the Lord. Hear, O kings. Give ear, O princes, to the Lord. I will sing. I will make melody to the Lord, the God of Israel. Verse 12. Actually, let's, yeah, verse 12. Awake, awake, Deborah, awake, awake, break out in song. Arise, Barak, lead away your captives, O son of Abinoam. Verse 24, most blessed of women, BJL, the wife of Heber, the Kenite, of, twen of tent dwelling women, most blessed. And then verse 31, so may all your enemies perish, O Lord, but your friends be like the sun as he rises in his might. And the land had rest for 40 years. Now that's a great summary statement because again in Judges there's a spiral of descent. But for 40 years their victory carves out some space of peace and obedience to God. Now, I said under the first point this is really special because we see this partnership between Barak and Deborah, and I've already argued, I hope persuasively, that Barak is a good dude, right? He's in the hall of faith. But if you doubt it, chapter 5 should obliterate it because they start singing together. Do you see that? They sing together. Do you remember when Moses had the victory after the Red Sea and then his sister Miriam, the prophetess, also starts to sing with the women and the tambourines? This one's even more inclusive where they're singing back and forth together. It's not always clear who is singing when. I don't think Deborah's calling herself awake, right? Awake myself, awake, you know. <laughs> Barak's probably saying that. Awake, Deborah, awake! And then I don't think Barak's giving himself pats on the back either. That's probably Deborah chiming in. And who knows? Maybe they're singing in harmony. Maybe they're singing in unison. They also go and give props to Jael at the end. That's why I read that. They're like, and praise the Lord, most blessed of women is Jael. They are just singing the praises of one another and God in the song. Do you see it? Say yes. There's nothing in there about Hey, he's a coward because he needed woman. And hey, women were taking my rightful place. There's none of that. It's just praise God how he used all of us in different ways to accomplish his purpose. 
It's beautiful. And their voices are distinct. Their voices are different. We sang up here this morning. Este's voice is different than Priscilla's. Are you thankful for that? He's got a man's voice, right? She's got a female voice. And they blend in beautiful harmony. They complement one another masterfully and beautifully, but listen loud and clear. Complementarity does not imply subjugation. It does not require subordination. Why do you say that, Pastor? Because Deborah's on the top. And he's okay with that. He's okay with that in this instance. Now listen. Listen. Deborah's married. Did you pick that up earlier? (laughs) Verse 4, she's a prophetess. The life of Lapidoth was judging Israel at the time. Where's Lapidoth at? Don't know. What's he doing? I could speculate. I think he's cheering on his wife. I mean, do you think he's really thinking his masculinity is threatened on the sideline as this huge victory comes to them? Again, we don't see it, but here's my point under this. Deborah's role as judge, Deborah's judge role as prophetess is different when she comes home and she's a wife. There's a a mutuality and a complementarity and a complexity in our lives that is beautiful. Listen, when I go home to my wife, I am dad to my kids, and I am a husband to my wife. One of the blurry things about being a pastor that kind of stinks is you're their pastor too, right? And just being honest, right? Like, But all of these complex roles in our lives, and sometimes men are in charge, and in this case, sometimes women are in charge, but it doesn't really matter. We just have to figure out where we are and what role we are in and what offices we're filling, and that doesn't lock us in here, That what we are over here. And my role as a father and as a dad does not mitigate my chance to be a pastor or the other things around. There is a breath to our callings as men and as women that allow us to serve God in so many different ways. And my concern in the body of Christ is that we are preoccupied with authority and submission, which there are Bible verses for as well, but in a kingdom where Jesus says, in the kingdom of heaven it will not be like this, and he says the top people will be slaves of all. And I'm pretty convinced that putting the word servant in front of leadership is not fixing the problem. It's not. And if you don't know what I'm getting lathered up about, I'm glad. (laughs) Because we got issues, church. We do. And I don't know the right solution for them. But I do know this, that this is a beautiful picture way thousand years ago, thousands of years ago. And I say, I think we have some great blueprints in our Bible for ways to think differently about this. And may this be something where we could be men more like barracks and Deborah's would arise in our own midst as well. There is a Raging debate in the body of Christ about women and leadership in the church. You say, well, where do we land, Manoa Community Church? I had never been in leadership at a church that had female elders, full disclosure, before I came to Manoa Community Church. And I was nervous until I got here. And I loved it. And that's not a case, Bible case. That was just my experience from all the nonsense I experienced before. And I read the EPC's position, and I want to put it on the screen because this is our denomination. And at first, I thought it was a little squishy. And the longer I'm a believer, the more I like it. (laughs) This is off of our website, not ours, but the denominations. When the EPC started in 1981, we determined that we would not disagree on the basic essentials of the Christian faith. But on anything that was not essential, such as the issue of ordaining women as officers or practicing charismatic gifts, hallelujah, We would give each other liberty, freedom. Above all, we committed ourselves to loving each other and not engaging in quarrels and strife. The result is when we get together in our churches, our regional and national meetings, we spend most of our time in worship and fellowship and almost none in arguing with each other. And that is true. And if you land in a spot where you say, I really believe in male leadership only in the church, you are welcome at Manoa Community Church. You're going to be a little uncomfortable at times 
Because you're going to see some women play some powerful leadership roles. And if you're in a world where you say, I want to see 50-50 and see it equal, you might be uncomfortable because this is not our gospel. We're not just banging the drum of female leadership. We're just trying to be biblical and empower everybody to go as far as they can for Jesus Christ with the gifts that God has given them. Amen? One of our core values, I want to put it up on the screen, is empowerment. And this was set the moment I got here. This is not new. We encourage one another to reach our fullest potential in Christ, both believing and expecting the best from each other. The first new members class, I had a woman who went through the class, and she went to a seminary that doesn't allow for women in leadership. And she pointed to this, and she said, does this apply to me? And I'll leave that to you all, because I don't appoint pastors at your church. You do? But you see, I am excited about Jane. I'm excited about other godly women who have no other agenda than Jesus Christ and him crucified. And again, this is not our gospel. The gospel is our gospel. Jesus is our gospel. But I see Deborah's and others in the Bible, and I say, praise the Lord for the harmony and complementarity and way that they shift and work together and beauty together. And we can affirm both. We can affirm the complementarity of the sexes, the distinctions of them. This is not like an androgynous church where anything is fluid and goad. No, there are differences in men and women, and we celebrate them, and we lift one another up despite and because of our differences. Can I get an amen? And we're not slipping and sliding into anything. We're, this is where we've been all along. This church has had female elders for decades, all right? This is not a change, but there's a lot of new people here. And I just want to tell you, this is a healthy church, and it might make you a tad uncomfortable, but I love that the gospel is more precious to us than our comfort, and that we love each other. Because I've been in circles that were together for the gospel but there was a lot loaded into that that wasn't simply the gospel. We are united in Christ together. The road to selfless glory unites men and women, leads to harmonious praise, and finally awakens heroic mothers. In the song, I just want to draw your attention to verses 1 and 2 and then drop down to 7 and 9. So they sing the song together, that the leaders took the lead in Israel, that the people offered themselves willingly. Bless the Lord, verse 7 the villagers ceased in Israel. They ceased to be until I, Deborah, arose as a mother in Israel. Verse 9, my heart goes out to the... Oh, excuse me, that's not the one I wanted. 12, there we go. <laughs> awake, awake, Deborah, awake, awake. Break out in song. The road to selfless glory awakens heroic mothers. Now... It asked the question, did Deborah have any kids? She was married? I don't know. <laughs> There's a lot we don't know. I don't know if she had any physical descendants. She maybe did, she maybe didn't. But I'll tell you what, she had a bunch of children. Because she was a mother in Israel. And what we're told here is that people were in fear. People were hiding People were afraid. People wouldn't even hit the roads until God raised up a judge. Remember, they were crying out, and God raised up Deborah. And it says, awake, awake, O Deborah, until I, a mother in Israel, arose. And I thought that's a beautiful way to describe her leadership because it shows that she is a spiritual mother. She is not abandoning her femininity in her leadership of the church. She is actually a mother, and the church needs mothers. Amen? We are a family. Did you know that? We are brothers and sisters, and we have spiritual moms and dads. And wherever you land in this spectrum, I would say this, it is a very dysfunctional family if you go home and the husband says, woman, be quiet, <laughs> right? Because we need dad's voice and mom's voice together. And she says, I am a spiritual mother, and she has risen up, and Barak's leadership and the church's leadership allowed her one in 12, there weren't six and six, whatever that means. I don't want to read too much into it. I'm just saying she was a great exception and very exceptional, and we thank God for her. 
And for many years, I missed a lot of the exceptional women in the Scriptures. But I want to show you some of the women who have been awoken by their faith in Christ as we start to bring this message to a close. Faith awakens heroic mothers. Hebrews 11 verse 2 uses the word elders. In the New King James Version, it says, for by it, in the ESV, it says, the people of old. But it's actually for by it, the elders, the presbyters, attain, obtained a good testimony. And there's a number of women who make up the elders in the hall of faith. Sarah shows up in verse 11. Jochebed, which is one of Moses' parents, in verse 23. Rahab, which Jane did a great job expositing. Verse 35 commends other great women of faith. There's also heroic patronesses in the New Testament. Joanna, Susanna, and Mary Magdalene. These are women who funded Jesus and the disciples' ministries out of their businesses and out of their wealth. Mary Magdalene was the first at the tomb and went to tell the disciples she is so celebrated in the Eastern Church they have given her the honorific title, the Apostle to the Apostles. That's pretty cool. Men are hiding. She is courageously sharing about the resurrection of Jesus. There's affluent businesswomen and heads of households like Lydia who shows up and her whole household is baptized. She's a seller of purple. There's heroic rulers like Queen Esther. There's heroic co-workers of Paul like Phoebe, a deacon of the church. Priscilla, whose name always, almost always comes before her husband, Aquila. And there's Junia, who was outstanding among the apostles. A third of the name in Romans 16 that Paul works with, his co-workers in the church are female. There are heroic house church leaders like Chloe, Nymphi, uh, Aphia. And there's heroic prophetesses like Moses' sister, Miriam, Holda, Isaiah's wife, was a prophetess. Anna of the tribe of Asher, she's prophesying at the temple in Jerusalem. Philip's four daughters. And Deborah, the judge and the prophet of Israel. That's a cool list, isn't it? You're not excited. That should inspire us. It's not unbiblical for women to do great things for Jesus. It's a beautiful thing that is celebrated in our Bible. Now, I know there are people wrestling with 1 Timothy 2 and 1 Corinthians 14 right now. Go back and listen to our preaching on the gifts of the Holy Spirit, and I'll address 1 Timothy 2 at another point in time. But I just want to say the rule of faith says that we use the clear Scripture to interpret the less clear Scripture. We don't let the Bible contradict one another. And I don't always know how to harmonize all of these texts, but I'll tell you what, Deborah and Barak make the list of amazing leaders in the church, and we can be confident in that. Can I get a hearty amen? And as you stand up, as we start to transition to worship, I want to highlight one more heroic mother in our Bible, because she's the mother. Go ahead, stand up. We're going to sing in a second. She's the mother of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Mary, who God used to bring the Son of God in the world. And we sang it earlier that God so loved the world that he gave his only son. But you know who else gave her son? Mary did. And the first miracle, she was the one tapping Jesus saying, it's time, son. It's time. And at the cross, she was at the foot of the cross seeing her son get nailed to that cross. But it's through her heroic actions and heroic faith that when that nail went through the hands and the feet of her son, that nail also went through the head of Satan himself. And it's through amazing men and women of faith throughout all of the ages that God is saving the entire world. Would God use you, my brothers and sisters, to go on mission for Jesus Christ? Would God use you to lay down your rights and privileges for the glory of his name? And just like the road to Hana, there's a lot of turns. It gets queasy at times. It's a little dangerous. There's places where we're tempted to fall off the edge of the road, but there is a glorious sunset at the very end, and the road to selfless glory is not about glorifying women. It's not about glorifying men. It is about glorifying Jesus Christ. To God alone be the glory for the great things he has done. To God alone be the victory.